Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's book talk, book launch, book panel, Teaching the Actuality of Revolution with Derek Ford and a host of panelists who we're all really excited to hear from. Um, my name is Kate. I'm here from the People's Forum and 1804 Books, which is one of the co-hosts and co-sponsors of this event. Um, I'll be pretty brief because I know that we have a lot of introductions and a lot of content to get through, but um, we are a political education center, a community center, a bookstore, a cafe. We wear a lot of different hats um, and we have a lot of programming. Um, so, for example, coming up, we have um, a lecture series with David Harvey on reading Grenrisa. Hope I said that right. Um, we also have concerts, fashion shows, uh, more book talks, conferences, panels, so many things. So wherever you are, if you're in New York City, please do stop by. And if you aren't, follow us on social media and our newsletter. We send out media digests every week to hear from struggles all over the world. And a lot of our offerings are hybrid, as is this one, so you can tune in from wherever you are. Um, we also have 1804 Books, which is, which is a community bookstore and press. Um, we have a book coming out in the next month or so, um, which is Selected Speeches of Hugo Chavez, so keep your eyes peeled for that one as well. Um, and and I think that's all I'll have to say on that. But other than that, we're really excited to be having this book talk because as a political education center, we're of course really invested in how we create new ways of educating people, teaching them about revolutionary struggle, teaching them how to struggle. Um, and we know that education as it stands today, it doesn't serve that purpose. Um, so we're really excited to be talking, uh, talking about Derek's book today and this exciting intervention he makes into the educational world of, you know, Paul, of creating struggle. <laughs> um, I'll pass it over to Maya to do further introduction but again, thank you to everyone for joining us, and thank you to Iskra and all the hosts for making this possible. Thank you so much, Kate. That was a wonderful introduction. All right. Hello, friends and comrades, and thank you all for joining us for our very exciting book launch and panel talk in celebration of our newest book release here at Iskra Books, Teaching the Actuality of Revolution, Aesthetics, and Learning, and the Sensations of Struggle by Derek R. Ford. I am Maya Vielba, um, one of the editorial board members at Iskra Books and Peace, Land and Bread. And uh, we are joined today by some truly brilliant speakers and thinkers, and we're thrilled to be uh, joining you today for what should be a very informative and interesting series of talks. So I'd like to begin by thanking the many hands and hard work that went into making this event possible. Firstly, a big thank you to Kate, um, and the comrades over at the People's Forum and 1804 Books for all of your support, um, hosting and organizing for the event. Uh, we appreciate you all and are always excited uh, to collaborate with you folks. Um, secondly, I'd like to thank all of our event co-sponsors, to our comrades at the Hampton Institute, the Critical Theory Workshop, the Journal for Critical Education, Policy Studies, Mayday Books, who is doing a live stream at their location right now, um, and especially to Midnight Books um, in Los Angeles. Oh, sorry, it's Midnight Books <laughs> in Los Angeles who are graciously hosting a live showing of the event. Um, we appreciate you all and look forward to many good collaborations to come in the future. Um, so just to kick it off, Derek Ford is a thinker all of us over at Iskra Books is, deeply admire. We've had the honor of publishing two of Derek's books now, and teaching the actuality of revolution excites us for a number of reasons, most specifically because it sees Derek move into an exploration of aesthetics and art um, as these relate to revolutionary education, pedagogy, and politics. Um, to quote the actuality, uh, to quote the distinguished educational theorist and professor Peter McLaren's um, recent review of Teaching the Actuality of Revolution um, for the monthly review, Derek's latest book, quote, expertly and clearly explains oppression and exploitation as perceptual ecologies and carefully constructs a communist approach to unlearning capital sensorium by performing alternatives in our present. And I think that's a beautiful uh, summary of all of the complex concepts that Derek so eloquently and articulately um, puts forward in his book. Um, so what is this book we have all come together today to celebrate and discuss? Um, Teaching the Actuality of Revolution, Derek's, as I said, eighth and most recent book, um, is a work of educational theory which explores the nexus between aesthetics, pedagogy, and politics. 
illustrating the central role that education plays in reproducing injustices and inhibiting various forms of confidence in the revolutionary struggle, demonstrating how capitalism and its attendant forms of oppression are not merely cognitive, but perceptual, that's a key word that he uses in his book, teaching the actuality of revolution proposes that revolutionary education demands the production of aesthetic experiences through which we sense the possibility and actuality of alternative worlds. To create such encounters, Derek develops a praxis of teaching and a pedagogy of unlearning that in our current conjecture creates conditions for encountering what one of our speakers who unfortunately is unable to be here today but has been a vital voice in this discussion, Jennifer Ponce de Leon calls an other aesthetics. And so mapping contemporary capital as a perceptual ecology of structures, social relations, beliefs, and feelings, teaching the actuality of revolution provides an extensive new set of concepts, practices, and readings for revolutionaries like us to better plan, enact, reflect on, and refine our organizing efforts. Um, as mentioned, we've brought together some truly brilliant and accomplished speakers, thinkers, and educators today. Derek will be joined in conversation with political scholars and organizers Summer Papachin, Papachin Gabriel Rockhill, Michelle Curta, and Kim Smith. Um, and so before I pass the mic over first to Gabriel and then to Derek, uh, the author of Teaching the Actuality of Revolution, I'd like to just briefly introduce myself, our event organizers and sponsors, um, and then our speakers so that we can move on to the event, um, knowing fully the deep amount of experience, expertise, and wisdom we have here on the panel. Um, and so I, as I said, I am Maya Vielba. Um, I'm an editorial board member over at Peace Land and Bread and Iskra Books. Um, I'm a Chinese and Cuban communist organizer and abolition from Lower Manhattan, New York City. Um, at New York University, I concentrate in social and cultural analysis at the College of Arts and Sciences and serve as the president of the Sexual and Reproductive Health Positive Club, also known as SRH+. As an organizer, I develop political education and cultural programming to cultivate sol solidarity between the broader and New York City com community and my organization called the Young Lords Collective. We're a local youth organization uh, working at the intersection between activism and artistry. Um, in my most recent work, uh, which should be published soon by Iskra Books, uh, excitingly, um, called Wretched Woman, a Manifesto on Abolition, Anti-Globalization, and the International Struggle for the Commons, um, I work through the dark underbelly of global corporate development and explain how social practices, acts of provisioning, and forms of peer governance offer practical tools um, of resistance against forces of late stage capitalism. Um, and so I'm very excited to introduce our um, sponsors. Kate briefly touched upon her work at the People's Forum uh, as a movement incubator for working class and marginalized communities uh, to build unity across historic lines of division at home and abroad. The People's Forum is an accessible educational and cultural space that nurtures the next generation of visionaries and organizers who believe that through collective action, a new world is possible and inevitable. Um, you can find their work at peoplesforum.org. Um, secondly, we have the Critical Theory Workshop, um, which is a nonprofit educational institution that seeks to bring affordable education with real use value to a broad public. Um, originally founded in 2008 as a dual language intensive summer research program in Paris, the workshop has grown over the years tremendously. Um, in addition to their in-person summer school, they offer an online summer program, seminars, and symposia in Philadelphia, uh, as well as online courses and lectures. Um, they have had the good fortune of working with a long list of prestigious uh, speakers over the years, including figures like Domenico Losordo, Genevieve Fraze, Pierre Machery, uh, Jacques Grassin. I'm like, excuse me for, for my pr pronunciation and many others. 
They have also made many of their discussions available in their video archive as a free educational resource that you can check out. Um, you can find more information about their 2023 workshop, including registration information at criticaltheoryworkshop.com. So please be sure to check them out. Next up, we have the Hampton Institute, which is a working class think tank founded in 2013. Uh, in contrast to traditional think tanks, they give a platform to working class theorizations, analyses, and commentary. They are named as a tribute to the former Black Pan Panther Party member and revolutionary martyr Fred Hampton, and also take inspiration from Italian Marxist theorist Antonio Gramsci and educator and philosopher Paulo Freire, um, a fan favorite I know personally over at Iskra Books. Um, Hampton does not seek to provide specific policy analysis for political parties. Instead, they seek to build class consciousness um, and end oppressive systems like capitalism, white supremacy, and patriarchy, and all in all, seek the liberation of the oppressed class. And so you can also find out more about their work at hamptonthink.org. Um, we have three more, three more people to introduce, so bear with me. Thank you for your patience. Um, we have the Journal for Critical Education Policy Studies, which is a peer-reviewed open access uh, and international scholarly journal that has since 2003 worked to develop Marxist and other leftist analysis and critiques of education. Um, JSEPS, uh, JSEPS, which is short for the Critical education policy studies, um, seeks and publishes articles that critique global, national, neoliberal, neoconservative, neo-fascist, new labor, third way, postmodernist, and other analyses of policy developments, as well as those that attempt to report on, analyze, and develop socialist and Marxist transformative policies, um, specifically relating to schooling and education from a number of radical leftist perspectives. And so they address issues of social class, race, gender, uh, sexual orientation, disability, and capitalism, uh, critical pedagogies, new public managerialism, and academic and non-academic labor. Um, and so you can find the journal at jceps.org um, and check out all of the amazing work that they do. Um, so I'm personally, I'm such a fan favorite of uh, the Journal for Critical Education. So by all means, please check out their work. Um, then we have Midnight Books, which is a radical bookstore and community event space in Uptown Whitt Whittier, uh, Southeast LA, California. Um, since their opening in January, 2022, Midnight has participated in several labor campaigns, mutual aid distribution, educational reading groups, and film nights. Uh, along with, you know, promoting and, and creating an atmosphere for music, art, and revolutionary study. Um, Mayday Books, um, which is located in the exciting West Bank community in Minneapolis, is a volunteer collective dedicated to selling left-wing literature. Mayday provides a space for political education and camaraderie um, as a nonprofit bookstore with a progressive educational mission. They provide quality political books to the public, both fiction and nonfiction. Um, and key, key part, sold at discount rates of 15 to 20% below cover price. So please make sure to check out a book at Mayday Books and Midnight Books and engage in revolutionary study with your fellow comrades. And finally, we have Iskra Books, which is an independent scholarly publisher, uh, publishing original and diverse works of revolutionary theory, history, critique, and art, as well as edited collections, new translations, and critical republications of older works. Um, and so here at Iskra, we seek to publish manuscripts grounded within the progressive and avant-garde dimension, dimensions of socialist and working class thinking. Um, moving revolutionary and critical scholarship forward in innovative and practical ways and pushing intellectual promotion, I mean, sorry, production outside of the academy and into the sphere of those actively engaged in real world liberation struggles. Iskra publishes in critical times for a critical revolutionary audience of organizers, educators, and comrades engaged in the heart of the struggle. All of us who are, you know, on this 
live right now. These are the people we're speaking to. Um, we believe at Iskra Books that we have, in the words of Marx, have nothing to lose but our change, chains, and that we have a world to win and we publish for that world. So you can find our work at iskrabooks.org and check us out at Peace, Land, and Bread. And I humbly thank you so much for tuning in and being with us for this revolutionary, productive uh, talk with so many brilliant thinkers and like-minded individuals. So I will pass it off to Gabriel Rockhill, um, who's one of our panelists. Thank you. Hey, actually, I think before Gabriel goes, I've been asked to say just a couple of words um, about the about the book and why I wrote it. I mean, first again, thanks everybody for being here and engaging, you know, uh, thinking with me about these topics and for everybody who made it happen. The, the panelists here is a very special group, I think personally and uh, um, uh, politically. And uh, just about this book quickly, I think, you know, it's really the culmination um, I found of my latest like my, I don't know, actually my only kind of phase of, of research, um, thinking through really the relationship between pedagogy and politics, which are usually either, um, which are usually generally collapsed into each other. And so what makes something pedagogical? What makes it political? Are they, you know, are there antagonisms or contradictions between the two? Um, but it's also sp spawned by like new interests and in particular, you know, aesthetics. And from this, uh, you know, I, I really draw heavily on Jennifer Ponce de Leon, as well as Gabriel Rockhill, uh, whose work, you know, in their historical materialist approach to aesthetics, in particular, the idea that aesthetics does not equate to like, quote unquote, art was very helpful. Um, and, you know, another, like, as I read their work, a lot of things that I previously, you know, engaged made sense. You know, there's this um, 1996 book by Don Mitchell, a Marxist geographer called The Lie of the Land. And he talks about like how the, the California landscape are produced, right? Not only by the labor that shapes the land, but then also by the representation of labor as the landscape that sort of naturalizes and harmonizes it. And so um, the, the pedagogy and politics are different, right? Because politics is about, it's like a struggle for power to like realize a particular political program um, you know, which comes into being throughout the revolutionary process and after. And pedagogy is different, though, because um, pedagogy is not organized towards like a, a particular, you know, realizing a particular set of values or a uh, set of policies. But political pedagogy then, right, has to like, where does that fit in? And that's really one of the things that I'm thinking through in the book. And you know, why teaching the actuality of revolution? Well, I think that has to do with our conjuncture uh, in the U.S. in particular, and really the fact that um, there's been what Brian Becker calls like an ideolog a break in ideological, ideological continuities in the people's struggles, right? In particular, after the fall and dissolution of the Soviet Union, um, and the sort of, you know, decade, couple decades of uh, unipolar U.S. imperialism, where the memory of, you know, the revolutionary struggles of the, you know, of previous times was sort of broken as Marxism was really largely discredited, all these other ideologies stepped in to take their place. Um, and so really for me, I mean, Marxism isn't about what Marx said or blah, blah, blah. It's really about the actuality of revolution. It's really about the fact that uh, we can't think about revolution as a possibility or whatever, but it's an actuality. It's something to be accomplished, and that has to guide us in every decision that we make sort of in the here and now. Um, and then I think the, the only other thing I really want to say is I want to give a shout out to Daniela Chaparro, who made the, um, whose painting is on the cover of the book. And I think that's it. I'll let the uh, panelists take it from here, but I'm very excited to hear what they have to say. Hi, <clears throat> hi everyone. So I'm going to kick things off, and all of my comments are also uh, comments shared with me by Jennifer Ponce de Leon. Unfortunately, she's sick and couldn't be here, but we've been talking about Derek's book. She shared her comments, and I decided to merge both of them 
in order to kind of outline what we see as some of the principal strengths of the project, but also some of the fundamental questions that it raises for all of us. First and foremost, I want to congratulate Derek on the book. Uh, it's a great contribution. It raises a lot of really interesting questions. And I look forward to the rest of the conversation. <clears throat> in preparing the comments uh, based on what Jennifer shared with me as well, I thought the best way to go about this would be to outline some of the fundamental themes of the book. And the very first one that I think comes across quite powerfully is the very nature of Derek's intellectual practice, which is highly commendable because you see the collective nature of everything that Derek does. Right? This isn't a project in which he's come up with his new own special theory that nobody else has, and he has this idiosyncratic vocabulary for it. On the contrary, the book is woven through with a whole series of other conversations that Derek is part of, and it's um, a testament to a kind of collaborative intellectual ethos that I think is absolutely central to the, the Communist Project and obviously to this book uh, in particular. So I wanted to highlight that. But the other thing is the way in which Derek opens the book is quite interesting. <clears throat> he refers to the intellectuals in the global theory industry who abandoned, this is a quote, if they haven't, if they even ever endorsed the revolutionary project, right? So he clearly positions the project in opposition to the type of theory that tends to dominate a lot of the theory industry within the capitalist world. And in particular, the kind of radical edge of that fear of that industry or what presents itself as the radical edge. And so I thought that this was a, an important element because it points to the ways in which so much contemporary theory within the capitalist world traffics in what I refer to as ABS theory, anything but socialism, meaning actually existing socialism, right? Socialism is an idea or a desire that can be fine, but actually existing socialism is largely um, verboten or beyond the pale for at least the most prominent theorists within this particular industry. And what's important to note, of course, is the ABS theory is a BS theory. Because if you want to fight and win in the current moment of ecological degradation, the risks of nuclear annihilation, capitalist downturn, and everything else, you certainly can't fight and win with a BS theory. In Derek's case, he counterposes to this, as he just mentioned briefly, the actuality of revolution. And this is an extremely important uh, idea to the book as a whole, of course, but it comes out of Lukács' reading of Lenin and is, of course, a theme in the larger global communist movement. And I think it's important to highlight, as Derek himself does in the book, that this isn't simply because we desire revolution or we want it subjectively. It's because there's already a world historical process that is underway. And Derek's book obviously situates itself within this deep socialist project that has been fighting and winning against capitalism through the course of the long 20th century, of course, but there are, there are signs of this early, uh, even earlier on. And so revolution is an actual reality. It's an ongoing reality. And it's one of the most pressing, if not the most pressing issue of our time, because the question that it raises is, will we destroy capitalism or will it destroy us and all or most of the biosphere? So the stakes of Derek's project are very, very high, and I commend him in situating his work precisely in opposition to those kind of radical recuperators who might want to sound as if they're revolutionary, but at the end of the day are not interested in supporting the most important world historical project at this point in time, and that is building a socialist world so that humanity and the larger biosphere can continue living and hopefully not only continue living, but uh, develop uh, and, and flourish in various ways. Another point that is important in Derek's work is that ideology is not simply understood as a set of ideas or illusions that one might have, but he really foregrounds the sensory, perceptual, and aesthetic elements to ideology, meaning that ideology is about what we, how we perceive the world, but also what we can and can't see, things to which we might remain tone deaf. And this raises a crucial pedagogical question. Right? And I'm sure we've all had experiences like this if we do outreach or if we're just simply trying to convince someone of a particular political argument. You can argue until you're blue in the face. And in certain instances, rational argumentation is insufficient. right? And it's insufficient because certain people simply cannot see certain things or hear particular types of argumentation. And this, I think, is the connection in Derek's book to the centrality of the issue of pedagogy. Pedagogy can't just be about rational argumentation if ideology isn't simply a set of false beliefs. 
what he advocates for, this is using slightly different terminology, is what I would refer to as a kind of multidimensional pedagogy that deals with every different dimension of human existence and human experience. We have to connect to people's perceptions and how they're oriented in the world, as well as their affects, their desires. We have to try to tap into and educate them as an entire human being. And so one of the elements that comes out of Derek's work is a kind of perceptual pedagogy, if you will, teaching people how to see what they might not otherwise be capable of seeing. In the first chapter, Derek engages with the question of commodity fetishism in the first volume of Capital. And I think this is a really central part of his argument and what he's advancing, this kind of per perceptual pedagogy, because commodity fetishism, of course, as Marx understood it, is a contradictory process at one level because one is at once capable of seeing a commodity and at the same time, that perception of a commodity is undergirded by an invisibilization or a rendering invisible of the social relations that produced that commodity. And it's that contradiction between being able to see something while at the same time being unable to see how that thing was produced that uh, undergirds, of course, uh, Marx's account of commodity fetishism, but then it also raises really fundamental questions about how ideology works. And so another leitmotif in the book is the relationship between the later Marx of the capital and all of its volumes, and then the early Marx of the 1844 manuscripts, and then the work with Engels in the German ideology, because a lot of what you get in the early Marx is a very refined attention to our sensory apparatus and the ways in which we see things without understanding the history of how our sensory apparatus has been composed and makes us see particular things and invisibilizes other things, as in the case of a commodity fetishism that would invisibilize the global social relations of production that produce a commodity like an iPhone or a computer that could be uh, that would have a kind of enchanting power that one would want to buy um, or indulge in in various ways with the gadgetry and whatnot, but that ultimately that invisibilizes the actual social relations that have produced it. And so part of Derek's work then raises this question of how if ideology is amongst other things, the ability to see certain things that themselves, that act of perception itself is founded on an inability to see the conditions that produce that vision in the first place, it recalled to me at least in, in reading both an earlier version of this book and in the final product, the ways in which Marx and Engels describe the camera obscura of ideology in the, in the German ideology. And that is that one of the things that ideology does is it takes the world and it turns it upside down so that what we think we see is the opposite of reality. And the way that Marx and Engels describe this is that that inversion is very much like the inversion of the image on our retina. And so ideological inversion occurs in such a way that we can't actually see it happen. What that means is that the primary datum of our experience, what we first perceive is ideological. It's not as if we see reality and then we put on some magical glasses and reality gets turned upside down. On the contrary, our very first perception of reality is ideologically composed in such a way that it inverts the very nature of reality. And so I'm sorry if this is a little bit philosophical or slightly abstract, bear with me, but I think that this allows us to see one of the fundamental moves that Derek makes in the book and why it's so important. And I'll use an example to illustrate this. There's a famous psychological experiment that George Stratton uh, undertook in the early 20th century, and then the experiment was later reproduced by other uh, psychologists. And that experiment consisted in fabricating a series of goggles that he wore 24 
Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for bearing with us. We just are experiencing some technical difficulties. Um, but the wonderful theorization and political and pedagogical insights you just heard from were from Gabriel Rockhill, um, who is a philosopher, cultural critic, and activist. Um, I just want to give him the space that he deserves um, and all of the wisdom that he's bestowing upon us um, and contextualize it with his uh, current work. So he is the founding director of the Critical Theory Workshop um, and professor of philosophy at Villanova University. Uh, he's published nine books, as well as numerous scholarly and journalistic articles, including most recently, um, A Counter History of the Present, um, Interventions in Contemporary Thought, and Radical History in the Politics of Art. Um, so for more information, you can find his work at gabrielrockhill.com. So while we figure out the uh, the nitty gritty of the tech-ish issues, um, I would like to introduce our next panelist, which is um, Summer Papachin, um, who's a second year PhD student at Northwestern University. She studies and teaches in political theory and international political economy, uh, one of my favorite topics, and researches in feminist theory and critical race theory. She's also written for Liberation School and Breaking the Chains Magazine, a wonderful grassroots magazine and think tank for the working class struggle, um, and recently published a book chapter in Bioinformational Philosophy and Post-Digital Knowledge Eco Ecologies. Um, Summer organizes with the Anna for Ward 45 campaign uh, in Chicago, where they're fighting against police brutality, fascism, and corruption. Um, so thank you so much, and, and I will kick it off to Summer right now. Uh, hey, everyone. Um, hopefully we can get Gabriel back on at some point after I'm done. But um, first of all, I'd like to say, you know, thank you for uh, having me here, Derek, and everyone else. Uh, thank you for that lovely introduction. And I'll start by saying that I have been a student of Derek's at our undergrad college. We were together for about three, four years. And we were also comrades because we did a lot of political work together on campus, stirred up a lot of trouble. And in a way, we still work together now. Um, and so in his book, Derek writes on, I forget what page, page 13. He writes, when learning from a teacher, the student brings the teacher's knowledge into their own outlook. It's just like, okay, fine, lame. You are internalizing the teacher's views. And it goes on, it says, but when being taught by a teacher, the student's life is interrupted as a teacher intervenes in the being of students through arranging educational materials, establishing relationships of trust and cultivating spaces for unexpected encounters. Uh, so let me just say that, you know, Derek definitely practices his own philosophy because I know a lot of students a lot of friends, actually dear friends, whose lives were interrupted by Derek and mine too. Uh, and yeah, I'm honored to be here to be able to talk about this book. Um, I was actually able to edit a draft of the book and help to like, I don't know, uh, go through an earlier draft of it. And I will say that, you know, reading the final book now, it's also beautiful. Shout out to a friend of mine, Danielle Chaparro for the beautiful cover. Um, I'll say that, you know, the final book is something I want every single person in my life to read, everyone I love, I want them to read it. And one, I'll start with one thing I like about it, and it's that, um, well, actually, rewind. I'm in a PhD program, like it was introduced, and at a mainstream university, you know, that does political science, and I study and teach in political science. And so I'm unfortunately very familiar with how Marx is being talked about in most U.S college campuses in most of the classrooms. And because of that, I really appreciated how Marx was treated in Derek's book, because it's a lot of, it's not flattery, but I would say it's appreciation for complexity. It's compassion for a thinker's whole self. <laughs> um, the book is very comfortable with uh, all the contradictions in Marx's thoughts, in Marx's thought, like the tension between his own writings and like different parts of his work. And because, you know, Marx at the end of the day was someone who was just like us working through his own ideas and trying to understand reality like us. And that's really how the book approaches 
Marx and it's really, you know, grounded in his tradition. And so I think that, you know, anytime any scholar in political science talks about Marx, this is how I would like for them to orient themselves to him. Um, I'll also say that the book is, I think, very helpful for educators and practitioners. Um, and when I say educators, I mean like not just professional educators, like moms and mentors who, you know, everyone is teaching someone something. But I also think like when it comes to professional educators, like people who teach preschoolers, like my mom, people who teach high schoolers, like some of my best friends uh, or even college age kids, I think the book is really helps us to reflect on our practice and on our lives and our relationship with students and what it means to be a teacher. Um, the book isn't like a how-to guide and doesn't have tips and tricks, but it does something even better perhaps in that it helps you reflect and try to think what, you know, you what's your goal in the classroom and what are different ways in which you can even understand the act of teaching. Um, I think for myself, at least, I got ideas about like what I would want to try in the classroom, even though the book never gave me any ideas. It just like prompted me to come up with them myself, if that makes any sense. And I think that that'll be a lot of people's experience with it. Um, it's just, you know, how he writes. Um, OK, and I also want to say that the book is very readable. It's a pleasure to read, like every time that uh, I was a little confused about a term. It was immediately defined. And that's something very important to me when reading and even when trying to write stuff myself. Like every term, like pedagogy, politics, educational forms versus content, whatever it may be, it was always defined. And I think that, you know, that's very, that's important and it makes it a pleasure to read. And then lastly, uh, I'll end on a point about disability and how the book uh, allows disability to permeate all through the book's philosophy, if that makes sense. Uh, I think a lot of people talk about ableism, this and that, but, and that's important, obviously, because, you know, the system we live in disables people every day and it oppresses the disabled severely. However, there comes a point where we have to ask, uh, how do we reformulate philosophy itself, like the way we see the world from the perspective of the disabled? Like, how do we reimagine very basic educational concepts? Like, how do you, like, what does it mean to understand something? What does it mean to study something? Blah, blah, blah. To reimagine these very basic ideas from the perspective of the disabled. And I think that this book, after having read it a couple of times now, I think it's a really good example of that. And maybe I'm overstepping, but um, one example, I think going off of what something Gabriel said was like about seeing and perceiving, right? So like Derek defines the idea of art and the idea of teaching both as like, uh, seeing and not seeing, or better to put it like seeing uh, in alternative ways than the dominant way of seeing, for example, right? And that's kind of the role of a critical educator or a revolutionary artist. Um, and okay, and then I'll end on a question for Derek, I guess, uh, or just for anyone who would be uh, have thoughts about it. And the question will probably irk you, Derek, because it's a little predictable, but I want to know what, like, a how, how, what you would think about um, a how-to guide follow-up to this book. Like this book is is, is perfect as it is because it's philosophy. But what about like a follow-up with like tips and tricks? Because I would personally want to see that um, from somebody. Um, for example, like what concrete means does a teacher use in a class to like enable their students to escape their disciplinary conditioning, you know, from capitalism? Like what what is it? What are the means that we use to do this? I think someone should write that book. Um, I think that actually Derek has a lot of those answers to that just through his own practice and, you know, teaching every day in and out. And I think a lot of other teachers have ideas too. So I would want to see everyone come together and write a book about the exercises, you know, for um, what this stuff can look like in a classroom. And perhaps you can like reflect on if, you know, that's something you even think is a good thing to do or if it's, I don't know, collapses possibility in some way. I'm just curious. Um, okay, well, and on that, and I want to, you know, thank the village of uh, comrades that brought this book lunch together and thank everyone for attending on this Saturday afternoon, taking your time out, and then I'll, uh, yeah, pass it back over to our uh, chair. Thank you so much, Summer. Um, that, you're right, that would be an amazing book to put together as, as 
almost a how-to guide for um, almost like, you know, the way that dialectical materialism is a living and breathing guide for how to concretely uh, bring about revolutionary struggle. I think the in the classroom setting, that would be absolutely helpful for the teachers of our generations and going forward. Um, and so now we'll go back to uh, Gabriel Rockhill um, to continue his uh, piece on uh, the pedagogical link between politics and um, culture and discussing the larger themes that uh, go on with uh, Derek's book. Uh, so thank you so much and I will pass it on to Gabriel. Yeah, sorry that I dropped out. The internet connection failed, but I'm glad that I'm back. I think I left off, I was talking about the perceptual pedagogy as one of the fundamental themes in Derek's book. And the image that I was left with and that I wanted to share with you that I thought was important is this goggle experiment that I mentioned was one in which George Stratton, a psychologist, fabricated goggles that made him perceive the world, everything in the world, upside down. And what was quite extraordinary about the experiment, which has been done and repeated since then, is how quickly he could acclimate himself and live in the world that was upside down, meaning that he could pour tea and write. And in later experiments, people with upside down goggles could ride bikes or go skiing. And so it demonstrates the malleability of perception and the ability on the part of human beings to actually live in an upside down world. And I think that what Derek's book is doing in its insistence on perceptual pedagogy is it's trying to train people who have been brought up in an upside down world, meaning a world structured by ideology, a world where they don't see actual reality. It's trying to train them to invert that world and see reality for what it is. And that art and culture play an absolutely central role in that. So another leitmotif in the book is the weapon and very important weapon of class struggle that is art and culture because art and culture can train us to see not only the world differently but to see reality instead of an ideologically inverted version of reality and this of course has been so important to the way in which the capitalist ruling class has imposed a certain image of the world i'll just bring two examples to the fore that i think are important one is that five mega corporations control over 90% of what all US Americans read, watch, or listen to. So the perceptual apparatus is controlled by the capitalist ruling class and only five corporations therein, which is an awesome amount of power to indoctrinate people. Uh, another important example of this is the extent to which the Department of Defense as well as organizations like the CIA and the FBI, have been very deeply involved in cultural production in Hollywood, as well as in TV production. Uh, in fact, there's a recent book, a relatively recent called National Security Cinema, that points out that 814 films and 1,947 TV titles um, have been supported by the Department of Defense. And the support by the Department of Defense gives them full censorship rights over every one of those screen products. And when I say that number of films and those TV titles, some of those TV titles are long running TV shows, which would only count for one in that count. So TV shows like 24, Homeland and others. What this means in short is that the capitalist ruling class knows full well and has known for a very long time that art and culture are absolutely essential weapons of class warfare from the top down. And what you get in Derek's work is the insistence on aesthetics as a form of perceptual pedagogy, amongst other things, as a weapon that has been used, of course, by the general working class, but that also needs to be further developed. And one central aspect of that, and I think that this overlaps with some of the general themes of this event, is that it's not simply sufficient for an individual artist to produce individual works of art that would contest the kind of dominant culture industries and the dominant ideology. If we want real power, then we have to go after the entire system of cultural production, cultural circulation, and consumption, because that's what's controlled by the capitalist ruling class. They not only own the means of production, they own the means of cultural production 
and circulation and consumption. And so it's wonderful that we've brought together such a broad panoply of organizations to do this event preci precisely because it's a testament to the struggle over culture and the need to develop our own means of cultural production, circulation, and consumption, which is being done by Iskra Books, by Peace, Land, and Bread, by the Hampton Institute, by the People's Forum, by Liberation School, which uh, Derek plays an absolutely central role in, by the Critical Theory Workshop, by, by the other uh, co-sponsors of this event. And so I think it's interesting that in Derek's own theorization, you have these elements that themselves are manifest in his own intellectual practice, but also in the event that we're currently participating in. Because ultimately what we need to do is just as there's a capitalist cultural apparatus, meaning there's a uh, capitalist control over the means of cultural production, circulation, and consumption, we need to develop a socialist cultural apparatus. And of course, this is already being developed in places like Cuba and China and Vietnam and elsewhere. But within the capitalist core, we have to do it in such a way that we also need to navigate all of the contradictions of what it means to control at a certain level me the means of cultural production while nonetheless being ensnared within capitalist social relations. We have to find ways of dealing with those contradictions, confronting them head on, solving problems that can be quite difficult to solve, like financing, right? Like the fact that you will rely on wages for various things. And so I would also like to encourage uh, everyone who is um, participating in this event to give thought to how they can individually and collectively contribute to this important project of developing even more this apparatus of cultural production, circulation, and reception that's in the hands of the people instead of in the hands of the parasites of the people. And this is one of the things that Derek's, not only his book, but for that matter, Derek's theoretical practice more generally, because the book is an outcome of so much of the collective pedagogical work that Derek's been doing for decades at this point in time. And so the last point that I'd like to highlight, and this is, I can phrase it a little bit in terms of a question because it's a very live question for me as well. It's a question not only for Derek, but for everybody else who is participating in this event. And that is that Derek, I think very importantly foregrounds in the book, the way in which ideology has to do not only with cognition, but also with sense perception, how we perceive the world. And this reminded me of a very important text by uh, Mao Zedong that's called On Practice. And one of the things that Mao does in this uh, text is that he demonstrates that there are these two levels and a third one I'll get to in a moment, sense perception and understanding, but there's a very important distinction between the two. And that is that you can, through art and culture, for instance, teach people how to see the world differently. You can teach them to see imperialism. You can teach them to see homelessness or poverty or the degradation of human life under the US healthcare system, for instance. But to see something can often be very different than to understand something. And what Mao insists on, it's a point that I have really taken to heart as of late, is that sense perception and an ideological reconfiguration of our sense perception, teaching us to see the world differently and to see the world more correctly, needs to be connected to a higher level of understanding. Because at the level of understanding, you can not only see something like injustice, but you can understand how it's produced. Uh, you can not only kind of be trained to perceive exploitation, but you can understand and know where exploitation comes from. So if the question that I have is whether or not Derek or others would agree that understanding actually operates at a higher level than sense perception because it's about having a systemic apprehension of where our perceptions come from, how they're produced, and that ultimately, and this is the last part of the question, is that Mao connects this to a third level, which is the level of practice. So ultimately, there's a dialectical relationship between sense perception understanding which is at a higher level because it allows us to see the system of relations that produces our perceptions but ultimately practice is the highest level because something is true not because it seems true to our understanding and we can have a coherent account or an internally coherent account of something it's true because our system of understanding can be tested in practice and transformed based on that practice so there's a constant feedback loop between understanding and practice. 
And I take it that some of Derek's work is a kind of great contribution because when you think of Derek's more broad kind of theoretical practice, he's someone who's embedded in practice, the practice of pedagogy, the practice of political organizing, and it informs all of the intellectual work that he does. And so I'm curious the extent to which this uh, Mao's description of this kind of dialectics could be mapped onto or inform this perceptual pedagogy that I was talking about earlier, meaning that, and this would be my final comment, that we need to not only train people to see the world differently and more correctly, but connect it to a higher level of understanding, but never remain at the level of pure cognition, connect that cognition to practice. Because of course, the whole point isn't simply to interpret the world or to see the world differently, it's to transform the world. And I think that Derek's book is a wonderful invitation to all of us to be invested in this dialectics of perception, understanding, and ultimately social and political transformation. So I'll turn it over to the next speaker with that. I feel so energized. Thank you so much, Summer and Gabriel, for your beautiful insights. I think as any other comrade would agree, hearing the voices and perspectives of so many brilliant thinkers just gives me more confidence and and desire to bring about this uh, eventual inevitable world um, that exists outside of the market system. So thank you so much for your insights. I particularly lo loved um, how you described the perceptual apparatus um, of our current uh, society being controlled by, you know, five major mega corporations and how, you know, capitalist uh a capitalist cultural and social apparatus must be met with its socialist counterparts so thank you so much for that and on that note of um Mao Zedong I I I love that article I love that um piece on on practice I also encourage our viewers to read combat liberalism uh just quite another extraordinary piece of scholarship that uh encourage us to move encourages us as comrades to move towards beyond peer cognition and into uh concrete social and ecological transformation so thank you so much um next up I'm going to introduce um our next speaker uh which is uh Michelle Kurta she is an educator, facilitator, and new mother working in the dynamic intersections between teaching, learning, healing, and liberation. Through her current collaborative project of Meaning Makers Collective, um, Michelle engages and amplifies insights and practices for disrupting the explicit and unconscious patterns of systemic inequality, uh, sorry, systemic inequity, and attain, attending to the wisdom of our bodies in service of personal and collective healing and transformation. Uh, Michelle earned a BA in Peace Studies from Goucher College, a master's degree in depth psychology from Pacifica Graduate Institute, and an MED in urban education and single subject teaching uh, credential from UCLA's teacher education program. Uh, Michelle taught language arts at the School for Visual Arts and Humanities in the LAUSD um, and has worked as a peer coach and facilitator of trauma-informed and healing-centered practices with K-12 through educators. So, after that after that you know energizing talk i would love to keep moving this forward with michelle kurta michelle let's kick us off with another amazing piece yeah wow it's so interesting to listen and integrate and then have to speak so um i think i i didn't really plan exactly where i was going to begin i hoped that it would come to me but i'm i'm thinking it, it feels important to me to uh, say that it's a really unexpected thing for me to be here speaking on this panel um, for, you know, in, in multiple ways, but um, it was a little blip in my bio, but I, uh, I you know, gave birth about four months ago. And this is not the book that I like expected I was going to be reading during this postpartum <laughs> time in my life. And um, I'm so grateful that Derek and I connected and that the invitation came to be here. Um, because I think this, you know, reading, reading this book has, has 
done something which I, um, you know, I was curious about how I was going to do, which is hold, hold open this postpartum space, uh, rather than, you know, have the experience of, um, you know, work and advice and these, you know, influx of, uh, what I'm supposed to do to make sure that my child is going to advance through these, you know, the appropriate developmental stages, um, which, you know, all felt like it was going to completely foreclose the really uh, radical space of, of um, having given birth. So I hope it's okay that I kind of uh, speak to this, not from a theoretical perspective, but just from, you know, this particular moment that I'm situated in. Um, I, I told Derek when I, when I read just the introduction to the book, it immediately, you know, brought up this, this postpartum kind of uh, space. And I think it also is important for me to mention that it made me think, you know, the most recent educational, explicitly educational spaces I've been in were these birth preparation classes that my partner and I were in and other spaces where I was you know, speaking to other pregnant people, speaking to birth workers, um, you know, trying to navigate and prepare for um, for an experience that uh, is going to be incredibly, you know, is going to be, you know, incredibly engaging <laughs> uh, in an immersive way, in a sensory way. Um, and uh, I can see, you know, there, there's a way that that in reading this book, it really made me reflect on um, the ways that, you know, not only that we're, you know, prepared for an experience like giving birth, um, the stories and the narratives that are that are told about what's actually happening to the body, what's, you know, what your role as as a as the birthing person is. Um, I think one one of the things I I uh, wanted to you know that or that it's illuminating for me is um, I spoke a lot and I learned a lot and like just talked a lot with other people about trying to have some kind of um, some kind of say in the birthing environment and I you know I was uh, privileged enough to be able to give birth outside of a hospital. Um, but I'm just thinking about like the the sensory environment of pregnancy and birth, um, and how um, you know the experience itself is one of such uh, like potential like rupturing of a, of a perceptual ecology, um, you know, and how the I would want to say the guides, the midwives, the the doctors, who, whoever is in that space, you know, um, are really performing like a teaching function in a lot of ways. And so I I'm, I guess I don't have, you know, I don't have a theory worked out, but I have a lot of curiosity about like um, the teaching that happens when, you know, it's not necessarily the teacher uh, point, you know, creating the moment of, or the, the disruption or the possibility of unlearning or opening the space through, through pointing as Derek talks about in the book. Um, but that there's a, mm, you know, a physiological, in this case, like a physiological thing happening that is rupturous and how to prepare ourselves as uh, teachers in those moments. Um, and in those, in those, you know, really like, I, I'm speaking about the experience of giving birth, but, you know, I, I also think about the experience of uh, becoming disabled, um, experience of injury or sickness, or, you know, any, any of these experiences that kind of affect like a, a caretaking relationship, which isn't always talked about as like teaching, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking I'm, and I'm wondering, and I want to, like, I feel really curious about uh, how to um, develop those these capacities for these like pedagogical moves that that 
that Derek's describing in the book um, in, in people and in spaces where we're not, um, you know, we're not, exp- there, at least, you know, we, we should be, I, I believe that we should be talking about politics in, in birthing spaces, but, um, you know, it's, it's not being explicitly talked about. Um, so I, I think that's where, that's where my thoughts are right now. You know, I, it, the reading the book really, you know, from this moment in, in my life, I feel like it, it has, like I said, in the beginning, um, has allowed me to hold open you know, to hold open the space of um, of unknowing, of specifically this concept of listening for what I'm listening for what we don't know. Um, you know, I'm. I think that the experience of getting to know you know this new being in our lives, uh, and listening to the to the the sounds, the you know, just like feeling the the movements and really, you know, recommitting to a practice of listening for what, um, for what I don't know. So much more to say, it's kind of, you know, I'm like, I can't believe I decided to talk about this thing of all the things, cause you know, but this is what's here right now. And I'm actually really, you know, curious to see where that conversation might go in the future. And I do want to say also, um, as an educator, a teacher, a tra- whatever, all these other things that were mentioned in the bio, um, I'm so glad that Summer brought up the the idea of a you know a follow up. Um, I would personally love to be involved in a you know in a, in conversations and opportunities to just like share stories about what it looks like in practice in different settings um, to you know to engage in these pedagogies. So I'm grateful to be here and you know humbled by being asked and uh, just really enjoy the opportunity also to be able to celebrate, you know, Derek and his work. Thank you so much, Michelle. I, I'm so humbled by the, by the diverse uh, experiences and perspectives that are just in this, you know, virtual room right now. Um, the links between politics, pedagogy, and parenthood are certainly uh, a, a complex one. And I would, that sounds in and of itself like an amazing book to <laughs> explore. I feel like as we're working through these concepts, we're figuring out new um, new sites of uh, academic exploration. Um, so thank you so much for your um, insights, Michelle. Um, we're going to move on to uh, our next panelist, Kim Smith. Um, she is a mom, popular educator, organizer, cultural worker, Southern scholar, Trekkie, and up and coming theologian. Um, born and raised in West Columbia, South Carolina. Um, Kim loves reading, studying, and learning, um, and redefining what and who is an intellectual and what's considered theory. Um, so I humbly ask uh, Kim to uh, bless us with her <laughs> insights. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much for having me. And I always thank you so much, Comrade Derek, for allowing me to be a part of this world. Um, I think it's really important to kind of ground and frame what world I come from. I'm not from a PhD background or a typical you know, teacher in a classroom. You know, I come from a very different world and this is a different world. So I always thank Derek for pulling me into a different world to, and challenging me about pedagogy and challenging me about theory and pushing me out of my comfort zone. I feel so blessed to have you as a comrade. So as I've been trying to, you know, making my way through Derek's book and going through it and reading it, I kept thinking about several things. And like the first thing that always stands out to me about Derek's writing style is it's beautiful. It's always poetic and beautiful and it flows in a way that it always flows in a way that makes me forget that I'm engaging with an academic text that is honestly, sometimes I feel like above my level of usual engagement or my education, but it always, you know, but I always get to go in and ride the wave of poetry, which I love so much. And I thank Derek for that. And that being said, even though the text was challenging, I was able to latch onto that tone that he uses and the rhythm that it was written in and continuously flow through the text. And so many questions and thoughts came to mind while I was trying to study this text. And I want to just really point out that I said study. 
I didn't say read because I think that this is a text that needs to be deeply studied. You know, I'll even go as far as to say that Derek has written a book similar to biblical texts that need to be approached using the exegetical method um, and a particular hermeneutic. So once I began to like find my footing, exploring all the twists and turns that Derek's writing took me on, the text is beautiful and it's a theoretical masterpiece. And I wanna just really ask Derek, you know, who was the audience when writing this? You know, I know Derek well enough, I feel like, to know that his writing is never focused on just these hallowed halls of academia or this one realm or people who are professional educators. I think all of these people in all these different sectors are vital to revolutionary struggle and the struggle for liberation. We need everyone from every sector but i want to ask you know i kind of want to ask derek or just really start to think about how else and where else this can be used you know this i know that this was a tool that is written to be wielded as a tool in revolutionary you know the revolutionary process and the revolutionary educational process which is needs to be and will be led by the working class and not necessarily just the working class that is already familiar with marx Lenin, and frary but as you're writing, Derek, do you think about that class or the sector of the class that are students of Septima Clark and their mothers and their grandmothers and their pastors and their Sunday school teachers and the woman on the corner that sells candy? The, those are the educators that we need to get the text into this. You know, we need to get this text into their hands, but not just get it into their hands because as I was delving deeper into thought, which again, I always want to say how happy that Derek's writing forces me out of my comfort zone and forces me to reflect. I found myself reflecting on how I felt when reading and where I was when I started. And I went through a lot of emotions when reading this. And I think that's the mark of a brilliant theoretical text, a text that challenges you and forces you to reflect and not just inform you, but to make you feel all the feelings, even if it's annoyance, because I did get annoyed with Derek a lot of times in this book, or confusion. And so I wanted to just really ask the final question, Derek, how are you planning on expanding the ways in which this book can be engaged in? I believe that a text like this can be used by seasoned organizers as well as the parent who is just trying to figure out how to combat the capitalist white supremacist educational system that their kids are exposed to. How do you make theoretical concepts in this book easier to grasp whether you're studying this in your local library or while you're sitting in, your, in the car rider line at school pickup? Because it needs to be studied but engaged in a particular way. So just given all of the elements of the book and all of the beautiful different descriptions and destination and the journey that you took us on. What is your vision for seeing for this book? What is your vision for other organizers to take this book and begin to close the gap between academia and the community? How do we ensure or how do you want to ensure that people won't leave this text feeling less than but feeling more feeling like they are revolutionary and revolution is possible and understanding the key role that education plays in the revolutionary process. How do organizers not quote, dumb it down? I hate that phrasing, but like that was the only thing I could think of, but make it plain and also create from this. Use this text as a start, as a base, as the art that it is to build and build their own pedagogical tools from this. So Derek, what is your vision for what's next for this text? Thank you. These are such wonderful questions. Thank you so much, Kim. Um, I'm still pondering on your last question and how do we leave this book feeling more, not less? Um, and I think that's a question that many of us in the academic community, you know, face in terms of re reconciling, you know, these deeply complex um, intellectual questions. Um, but then at the root of it, you know, turning to practice and and moving beyond that pure cognition that Gabriel was talking about earlier. Um, so thank you so much. Um, lastly, I want to introduce um, Derek Ford, the author we've come together today to celebrate. Um, but as I introduce him and as uh, Derek, um, you know, uh, tells us about his um, outlook on uh, all of these ideas. Um, I want to encourage everyone who's watching live to drop questions in the comment section. Um, we will have time for a Q&A afterwards, so please feel free to um, put any lingering thoughts, ideas, 
questions, anything of that sort, um, so that we can really um, make this a community event uh, uh, with the rich experiences and um, intellectualizations of everyone in this circle, not just the panelists, not just us, but everyone online who is engaging in, in live time. Um, and so uh, I'll tell you the way, so Derek, um, is a teacher, educational theorist, and organizer currently working as an associate professor of education um, studies at DePaul University. They've authored eight books, including Encountering Education, uh, Elements for Marxist Pedagogy, and Politics and Pedagogy in the Post-Truth Era, uh, Insurgent Philosophy and Praxis. Um, in addition to their popular writing, which has appeared in outlets such as uh, Block Agenda Report, Monthly Review, and the or or Nico uh, Tribune. Uh, they hosted the podcast series uh, Reading Capital with Comrades, um, as well diving into uh, Marx's original texts on Capital. Um, and so, Ford is also the editor of Liberation School, an associate editor of Post Digital Science and Education. Um, as well as an organizer with the Indianapolis um, Liberation Center and Answer Coalition. Um, so last but not least, Derek, take it away with uh, your wisdom and, and intellectual uh, theorizations. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you everybody for um, you know, your reading and your, uh, your responses and reactions and questions um, and interpretations. They're very helpful. Um, I think there's a couple of things that I definitely want to respond to because I think that they're very important um, and I'll try to sort of link them together in a, in a way that's as organic as possible. Um, but, you know, I, I think in response to, to Gabriel's, you know, point about, um, you know, the sense perception and then understanding and then practice, I think one thing is that, you know, um, right now, like the reason why I privilege uh, sensory perception in this book is because like how many more critiques of capital do we need, you know? And I mean, obviously we need more, you know, and we need more refined ones. Um, and we need to explain those to people. Right. But, you know, it's like, it will need it, in terms of like whatever the global theory industry, you know, wants to pick up, it wants to, um, you know, there's like a, there's a sort of limitation to that. Right. And there's a way in which like, I don't know, potentially even like revolutionary scholarship can fit into the circuits of capital. And so I think that there's there's an element of the conjuncture, but I like that there's a there's a dialectic there between um, you know sense, understanding, and praxis because ultimately that's where you know I mean that's the that's the task of sort of in a sense that's the task of the teacher right which to me might respond to Kim's question in terms of like the audience right the audience for this book is not necessarily like other teachers per se. I mean, it's really people who are engaged in popular or political education or even organizing who might not think of themselves as educators and as teachers. And when that happens, right, then our received uh, or preconceived notions of teaching and education, we just sort of graft those on to, you know, political experiences. So wanting to sort of make that distinction between uh, pedagogy and politics and the aesthetic is sort of a nexus between the two. And the, um, I think that the, the main problem today, at least in, in my experience and in the US, is that like the, the idea, the idea obviously that we can rebel and resist is always present because that's been present as long as there's oppression, right? There's always resistance. But the idea that we can actually like take power and reshape you know, the world in the interests of the, the exploited and the oppressed of the world, that's what we really need to like rejuvenate our belief in, right? And that's the actuality of revolution. And something that Althusser talks about as, you know, he says there's like two ways of thinking, right? Or scientific thinking. One is basically it just, you just see like history as the inevitable, inevitable result of the thing that came before it and is the, you know, the, the conclusion to all of that. And then there's the other way of thinking, which is the Marxist way of doing science or thought, which is basically it starts from the act, the fact to be accomplished, right? The the actuality of revolution. And it sees the present moment as nothing more than like an assemblage of previously accomplished facts, but without any teleo 
teleology or like linearity. In other words, without any like, you know, evolutionary or developmental stages going between them, right? Because ultimately like, and that's why I appreciate Althusser is that he really wants to reclaim complexity and heterogeneity within communist practice. And for me, that's what I've always found so interesting about Marx and why I've always thought that Marx, Marxism um, you know, which is more than just Marx, of course, the Marxist tradition has been able to spread throughout the globe to inform and arm, uh, in addition to, of course, the socialist states offering crucial support for those national liberation and socialist struggles, um, like, you know, so many different places, because ultimately historical materialism is historical and material. So it's going to adapt depending on, you know, your, our circumstances. So it's a living, you know, and breathing uh, doctrine. And I think that it's the, there's also a difference I want to that I posit between understanding and thinking, right? Because understanding is when I've like brought, you know, I, I sense things and I've read things or whatever, and I and I sort of bring it into my own cognition. But then there's the process of thinking, which I think is like uh, not emphasized enough, which is the sort of experience of thought itself, right? Where you're you're studying in your own mind without any sort of predetermined conclusions or outcomes. And in a sense, I think this is kind of the, the, the impossible, but also magical task of teachers, wherever they may be, right? And whatever, whatever like, you know, division of labor or whatever they, they might be, is that, um, you know, the, the teacher, like for education to be liberatory, it can't just be open, you know, like do whatever you want to do, right? But neither can it be like closed, right? Like here's the ultimate outcome. And so what I'm thinking of, like the contribution is really that education, like Marxist philosophy or Marxist, yeah, philosophy produces like theses, right? And like they're weapons in a fight that you, like, how do you, you know, figure out if a theory is right or not? Well, in practice, you know, you can't like figure that out through mathematical proofs. And then science is something that produces, uh, you know, knowledge, even though Marxist science, you know, the knowledge is continually reproduced. But then Marxist education for me is really about the experience of that thinking as it's happening. You know, the experience that the world is and can be otherwise, basically like, on you know, unlearning capital sensorial regime or perceptual ecology um, by, you know, which happens whenever that, whenever that which is familiar seems strange all of a sudden, right? Whenever that which we thought was like, you know, timeless or whatever, right? Um, all of a sudden seems like, oh, wait, this is very historical. There are precise reasons why this is so, right? There's historical reasons. Everything is a result ultimately of production and struggle, which I think in turn kind of, in turn kind of speaks to, um, one of Curtis' questions, which I, I really appreciated. I mean, all the speakers, but you know, especially how you responded to it as in the postpart in the post as the postpartum era as like a void or a gap, right? Because ultimately, that's the thing that I think political pedagogy has to respect, um, because is basically the void or the gap between the world as it is and the revolution, right? Um, if you close down that void, if you suture over it, then, um, you know, you basically like just it's all political. Right. And there's no actual there's no actual pedagogical experience. And so the pedagogical aspect is really about encountering um, unforeseen and unexpected and chance uh, materials. Right. That are arranged in a particular way by a teacher to, um, you know, basically help us wonder. Right. And wonder is educational. That's pedagogical. But wonder on its own is kind of abstract. Right. And a ahistor historical, which is why wonder for me always has to be linked in this project with the actuality of revolution, the facts to be accomplished. Um, and so I, I also like the connection with childhood because that I mean, that's something I thought about a lot. Right. Um, having been a child myself, of course, I, I don't have children per se, but, you know, Childhood isn't just like a, a particular stage of like the human's development, right? It's always with us. You know, it, it comes out in those moments when like we find ourselves without words, without the ability to like make sense of something, uh, when something disturbs our sense making and our previous thinking. For me, that's really childhood, right? Um, interrupting, right, the adult life. And then it was, I think that the other thing is that rupture, and I make this clear, right? So learning for those who, 
you know, I haven't read the book or whatever, you know, is basically like a, a process that's always predetermined by an end goal, right? It's only because I know what like it, it looks like to write a good paper that I can like evaluate your progress along the way and say, okay, yeah, you did 75% of it. You're, you know, 90% there, hundred percent there. Um, and learning is really about bringing things into our own understanding, right? Um, and unlearning, and, and so through learning really in, in, in our conjuncture, like we basically view education as an economic transaction, knowledge as a commodity, we view ourselves as individuals, um and end up you know like individualizing our own desires and ambitions because we have to di differentiate ourselves you know in the competitive like labor market global labor market but unlearning is different in that what it really does is it it's about you know i do take up the definition of teaching as like a pointing to something right um and Unlearning is about facilitating breakdowns that don't close or solve the void between like the present and the revolution to be accomplished, but helps us experience that void. And so therefore interrupts capital's drive for like constant, fast, you know, sense making and and uh and is rather about experiencing the limit of knowledge and understanding, right? Which prevents the accumulation of knowledge. And so um just a couple of other things if i can if i have time and just feel free to come interrupt me if you want me to stop but um i think the other thing was sense and i say this i'd say this early on but uh in the book but it's a very minor point which is the you know tyson e lewis influences this this work a lot and for him you know ed educational politics isn't about changing consciousness but it's about you know the pre-cognitive experience of perceptual foreplay Right. But for me, it is also about, you know, consciousness and ideas. And this is why I think that Marx's, uh, you know, break with the Hegelians, uh, Marx and Engels break with the Hegelians is so important because, you know, from the 1844 manuscripts where Marx basically endorses, you know, the Hegelian idea and Feuerbach's idea of, you know, sensuous certainty, then in 1844, Five to 46 when they wrote the manuscripts which were not published for a while later they reject that and they're like there's no such thing as sensuous certainty right because like all, our senses are historically produced right that like that which we sense how we sense what we don't sense are all historically produced and of course i think pedagogically produced right i mean so much of our education is about like look here don't look there you know listen to this don't listen to that um you know like touch this don't touch that don't lick that right um and it's really about teaching us like what what to do with each of our senses and attributes a particular um sensuous capacity to a particular like organ or part of the body right which is why you know sound i give i give this example early on and there's some other parts in the book about sound and listening but you know sound we associate with the ear right because we're all wearing earphones and you know i'm listening to this or whatever but um, you know, before the introduction and widespread availability of the record or the phonograph, um, you know, list, like listening wasn't really about the ear, right? It was visual um, and it was felt, right? It was touched. Um, and in fact, when record players first came out, uh, there's an article from like a 1923 journal about this guy, you know, uh, using record players when he's teaching. And he's like, you got to put the record player in the back of the room because or else people will just stare at it. Right. Because at the time, that's what you did, because music wasn't separated from its like spatial location, you know, and its social context and its its place and its time. The, the phonograph, the record allowed that to happen. And so what people would do is they would just literally stare at the record players, right? Which te teaches us one, that our senses are historically produced, right? And change over time, but also that there's no, like we can't isolate or attribute any particular sense to any particular organ or part of the body or sensation, right? Um, and so that in itself, I think is an opening up of the sensuous you know, world around us and the different ways in which we can sense things. And then, of course, when we know that and we can name that, then we sense it differently, right? We sort of like the, um, you know, I see something and I'm able to make sense of it in a different way, rather, right? So if that makes sense. Um, and a couple of other things, if I can, 
and again, just like you can put in the chat to shut up or, you know, just to come on and interrupt me. But um, in terms of, you know, Marx, my engagement with Marx, as Summer talked about, I, you know, I think the more and more I read Marx, um, and it's not out of like, I have to, you know, he's right about everything or whatever. And, you know, and, and in fact, like that's, he, he's constantly saying like, oh, I used to think this, but now this is true. You know, now I think this, right? Um, I used to think that the socialist revolution or the revolution, the socialist revolution in the advanced capitalist countries would be the thing that, you know, sparked revolutions elsewhere. And then he later says, actually, no, anti-colonial revolutions, anti-slavery revolutions could be the spark that ignites the socialist struggle in Britain. So it's constantly changing his mind. He's constantly thinking. Um, but one of, the, one of the things that really stuck out to me recently is, you know, you know the way that in, in academia, you know, it's always like Marx's theory of primitive accumulation, but Marx never talks about that. He talks about so-called primitive accumulation, right? And really the reason it's so-called is because, so primitive accumulation, you know, it's usually, it's like basically the way that the bourgeois political economists said, you know, capitalism came to be, which is that one group, smart, frugal, you know, forward thinking, saves their money, becomes capitalist. Another group, me, lazy, dumb, you know, uh, wasteful, you know, becomes the worker, right? And so, you know, Marx corrects that in terms of where capital came from. And the original capital came from Britain, right? Which is, you know, slavery, uh, the, 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 uh, the slave trade um, in, in the U.S. in particular, the racialized slave trade in the U.S., colonialism, uh, you know, the genocide of indigenous peoples, the looting and the conquest of peoples and territories and so on and so forth. But, you know, he, he says it appears as primitive, right? because it's the prehistoric stage of capital. But he says it's a vicious circle because of course, capital continues to do this, right? And it's and capital is like a, an ongoing process. It's never like finalized, right? It's dynamic. And so as I'm reading this section again, I'm, I'm just like thinking about this notion of the vicious circle and how really what capital does is it tries to present a narrative in which, right? There was a time before capitalism and then these things happened and now we're in capitalism, right? This sort of linear, uh, stage. But what Marx is actually doing is he's saying, like, look at this is basically capital has to continually reproduce itself and its origins. And so what he's doing in the book, as I read it, is an aesthetic pedagogy that's helping us sense the gaps in the present, right? The capital tries to cover over, which is why so many of the readings that dismiss it or whatever, you know, I think really function to ultimately like inhibit our belief in revolution. Um, and also to, you know, get us wedded to a sense of, of, of time and it really is capital's abstract uh, temporality that does that. And um, I think two more things is that one, you know, uh, in, in Peter McLaren's review, which I appreciated because it was critical, uh, he says that this is the first book he's read of mine that actually has a good ending. I think that that's probably true. And at the end, he kind of says that, you know, um, like Derek has this united front kind of approach to thinking and to organizing, but there's also some sectarianism in the beginning of the book. And so I think that that's actually true and a bit of a contradiction um, where the basically calling out some of the original like founders of critical pedagogy, which were kind of part of this anti-communist break uh, in the 1980s, along with neoliberalism that accommodated it. Um, you know, like there was a time when there that needed to be sort of like polemicized against and called out. But I think that, you know, that time might have passed and that we're in a very different situation now in which socialism is very popular. Um, you know, more and more people are like taken to the streets and um, and so on and so forth, which also, you know, I'm down to do like the, the conclusion of the book for me is a kind of model for how to practice this, this idea of perceptual mapping, where we map out as much as we can about our total the totality in which we exist, right? Which is like impossible, literally, right? You can't map it all out. It's always changing and it's also global, right? And it's historical, there's a whole history behind it. Um, and then, but through, but through doing that kind of mapping, then we learn something about the totality that determines us, but we also unlearn it, right? By um, sort of remapping it in a different way. And so learning and unlearning, I think, can be, should be, have to be blocked together, right? I don't think that one should be prioritized over the other. The problem is that in, in historically, in Marxist and the revolutionary traditions associated with communism, content has been the main thing rather than the pedagogical form. So I'm trying to compensate for that. But 
there might be times when content takes priority, right? Um, and where that is is more important. And um, and one final thing has to do with this notion of rupture that Kurta brought up, which is that uh, there's a point I, I I should have made it more at the end of the book or at the end of one of the chapters, but you know to privilege rupture and like breaks and breakdowns and making the you know all this stuff like it can come across as like okay yeah but like our I mean you know I think like there's already too much rupturing in my life like my life is constantly breaking down you know like I never know if I'm gonna have health care or not or like what my, if I'm gonna have a job or not but the thing about um, unlearning is that it actually creates a rupture within that that allows like past times, you know, present times and future times to come and be felt um, in which like tradition, for example, isn't something of the past, but we experience it as something that is still living. So I, of course, have more to say, but I've talked long enough. Thank you. Thank you so much, Derek. Um, I appreciate all of your insights and critiques and just everyone who has contributed to this talk today, um, just hearing all of the theoretical um, thinking and, and, and perceptual mapping um, in your words that occurs in, in everyday discussions like this is just so powerful um, to see and, and allows us to move forward in our revolutionary praxis and, and thinking. Um, and so, uh, on that note, uh, I would like to turn it to a Q&A uh, panel. Um, I'm looking through the um, uh, comments right now in the live chat, um, and it looks like someone, uh, Michael Hughes says that he's uh, very interested in the question of finding ways to simplify lex leftist and Marxist thought. Um, he also says, we also need modern critique of capitalism that doesn't solely rely on traditional Marxism. And we need to find ways to modernize Marxism to fit a modern world. Um, just to, before I open that up, I, I would highly um, recommend um, this one piece by Walter Rodney. It's called uh, Marxism and National Liberation. Um, I think that's where... Um, Michael, if you're still in the in the uh, Zoom room, uh, to to turn to that text because it 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 delves a lot into how traditional Marxism has you know in different revolutionary contexts and movements have have been almost morphed in, in to apply to the specific historical conditions and social meanings within um, within a certain people a certain point in time. So um, I'd really uh, emphasize that that uh, article. Um, but just opening it up to the rest of the panel, um, any last um, thoughts or last remaining lingering questions um, that we have for Derek or really anyone on the panel? <laughs> Oh, I just saw in the chat, uh, Salma uh, Alam asks, kind of wondering what you mean when you say, wonder if historical, if is, historical. Is a historical, yeah. Right. yeah. Oh, does someone wanna, wait, hold on. Yeah, so earlier I said that um, wonder on its own is kind of like abstract and ahistorical. And what I mean by that, uh, Comrade Sama, um, who I also know from Depa, one of Summer's uh, co-leaders of, of the socialist group, is that basically like wonder on its own, like, okay, wondering is fine, but for it to be political, it has to be like guided towards some kind of end, right? Not in order to reach that end, because then you're not wondering, you're just trying to reach that end, right? But rather wondering um, with this sort of end goal that's present, but not determining everything that you're thinking about, because or else you just close down possibility, right? And this, I think, also speaks to like Michael's question, which is like one, um, you know, for me, Marxism doesn't name like a, a body of thought, right? There's like, I'm, I say that there's like, you know, I'm all for like one, two, three, many Marxisms because there are, right? And it has to evolve because that's the whole point of it, right? Is like, you know, Marx never made predictions, like, or he was never like, this is exactly how it's going to happen, you know? 
Um, he was constantly changing his mind. And that's precisely the reason why I think it carries so much, ha has historically informed really some of the you know broadest transformations in the world. Although of course, before Marx, I mean, he says it himself, like he didn't, and he didn't discover the class struggle, right? He says that very early on, like class struggles existed as long as like societies have been divided, right? Between classes. And so for Marx, class isn't actually just like about workers and owners, right? Class is an expansive thing. And the Communist Manifesto, he calls it a camp of the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, right? And also their processes, right? So they're camps rather than like, you know, like empirical categories, which is important because Marx, you know, and, and the communist tradition also considers, you know, uh, oppressed nationalities, colonized peoples, of course, as part of the proletariat, um, even if there, you know, there's, there's other categories too. And then I think that, you know, one, um, I think that Marxism should be and is broken down in many accessible ways to people, uh, this kind of speaks to something, Kim, maybe you have a response to this, but in terms of like getting these ideas out there, one one of the reasons why I had so many people like read drafts of the book is because like, all right, you don't know this literature, like does this make any sense to you? And the feedback I got was very, very helpful. So I think it's like, you know, it's accessible, uh, but it's also coming from like the traditions that, you know, I, I've been invested in. Um, and so my hope is really that like, you know, as I said, I'm down to make like, help collectively make kind of like a, you know, a strat a set of strategies or tactics or whatever. Um, but I think that, you know, really my, really the audience is like political organizers, you know, as well as like people who are interested in politics and, and who might be interested in like aesthetics or just it for whatever kinds of reasons, right? Uh, but any, any other responses from the? Um, yes, we have, um two questions. Um, uh, I'll just pose this to the whole group. Um, Chronic <laughs> you, YT Watcher asks, uh, do you guys think uh, reading Marx books is a waste of time? I'm confused with the post-Marx uh, Marxism, um, and it is getting worse after Gabriel criticizes Zek. I don't know what to rely on. So I guess a, 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 a I guess a wondering, I guess, the applicability of, of traditional uh, Marxism and how, how we can use Marxism today. I'm gonna let Gabriel respond, but I will just say one, it has to be collective. You know, like that's, we need teachers. I need teachers to point me to the right and the relevant content, right? Um, and that's the um you know like who you like who should i read i don't really know you know like i don't what should i do in the struggle i don't know because i don't know the struggle as an individual i have to be part of an organization and part of a collective to know my place in it to know like oh this, you know whatever even to like create so really what, what i'm trying to do is create a common set of concepts right and sort of ideas that we can use as organizers to reflect on these processes right and, um, you know, part of that comes also in the interest in aesthetics comes from, you know, um, my work on and around uh, and with uh, d disability, right? And the way in which, something that I talk about in the book, it's kind of, I mean, there's, there's a couple of points about it in the book, but, you know, one is that, I mean, what basically like, one, Nirmala Aravellos makes the important argument that all oppressed groups in general, right, have been oppressed based on their proximity to like the disabled. Right. So women have been oppressed because they're irrational or whatever. Right. And so then the, the question for those movements is like, well, do we try to like say and prove that we are this type of, you know, fully human or do we like fight for our own way of being? And so one of the things that one of the reasons why I got interested in aesthetics is be, because they're like, I mean, there's this video of Mel Baggs that I showed in my class, one of my classes, like all the time called In My Own Language. Uh, Baggs was an autistic person and it's a really, really fantastic video that basically is like, look, I can like do all these things. I can touch, I can look, I can smell. And like, you know, in, in their own language, they're actually like constantly communicating with the world around them. But when they're, when they focus on just one thing, that's when they're said, they're like, you know, they're, they're becoming human. Right. And they're like, you know, they're becoming like, whatever, like actually, it's actually when they like uh, limit their communication, limit the senses, right. And limit what they're sensing that that happens. So anyways, um, 
Gabriel, I don't know if you want to, I mean. I could say a word or two. I mean, I think that, you know, Marxism is the collective science of human liberation that is constantly being adapted to new and different circumstances. And in that regard, when you read Marx and the Marxist tradition in the broad sense of the term, you're tapping into this theoretical project that is trying to map and understand the world so that we can transform it because it's part of a practical enterprise as well. So it's absolutely worth reading Marx and books within the Marxist tradition, the Walter Rodney that, may, uh, that uh, was referenced earlier, but then there's a lot of other work within this tradition that can give us a clear sense of what it means to understand the world in order to transform it. And there's other versions of, I wouldn't call them Marxism, it's Marxian in the sense that there are discourses that borrow from the Marxist tradition and that then mix that Marxist mode of analysis with other discourses that are non-Marxist. And this creates a lot of confusion because those discourses then often either water down or commodify Marxism, might make it trendy and sexy to, you know, a few undereducated people within the petty bourgeois intelligentsia, but doesn't really contribute in any meaningful way to class struggle and the class struggle in, in the sense of the class struggle for the workers, not the class struggle from the capitalist ruling class. And so I think it's extremely important to engage with the Marxist tradition. At the same time, I think it's also important, Mao was someone who insisted on this, and that is, I mean, he said it in a kind of funny and provocative way. He said, you got to be careful not to read too many books, um, because you also need to be involved in the struggle, and you need the practical elements so and the practical experience so that you're not just reading in a bubble. And another big part of the problem with certain Marxian traditions is that it's discourse for discourse's sake. It's about being right. It's about playing games with ideas and discourses. It's not about solving the most pressing issues of humanity. And so the primacy of practice should be the beating heart of how we approach these texts and ultimately how we judge them, right? Do Are they serving the project of human liberation or not? And if they are, let's learn as much as we can from them and engage our struggles through the framework of their analysis insofar as they're helpful. Thank you so much for that, Gabriel. Um, I completely agree with, with what's been said. Um, every time I, I think about uh, just the path of, of Marxian um, thought, um, I just think of uh, a story that I uh, was told to me actually in during the People's Forum Revolutionary Summer School um, and that uh, Ho Chi Minh, uh, owned, he prided himself in that he owned uh, Marx's capital um, as a pillow <laughs> initially. And, you know, it wasn't until he really got into the nitty gritty of, you know, understanding um, the Marxist tradition um, that, you know, he delved into that and, and, and you know, was open to, to this, you know, history of, of, of revolutionary thinking and theorizing. Um, and that, you know, it's only, you know, a, a, it's a living and breathing guide, just as, you know, in di the dialectical material method is. It's, it constantly needs to be refined, as Derek um, mentioned earlier, and it constantly needs to be in conversation with current and, and past uh, movements internationally. And so uh, I'm also going to pick up on uh, Nat's question. Um, they say, uh, for those struggling to improve critical thinking, how can the individual get into the practice of moving through those stages from sense to understanding, thinking, and practice? Um, they continue, also for those of us who may not be used to cognitively thinking in that way, but want to, and especially if you're studying, reading, learning, um, independent of an education system. Um, so let's just say if you're not in school or being traditionally taught by an educator or parent. Um, so I'm going to open that up. I'm happy to respond, but let me give others a chance. I mean, I had a thought, and maybe this is also a question to you, Gabriel, about that, you know, that what you spoke about um that it's not it's not a linear 
progression mm -hmm. from sense to uh, to understanding the practice, but to begin at practice, to begin at observing, um, observing what we're doing essentially, wherever we are, um, and to start understanding that as our practices. Uh, and from there, um, I really, I really like the idea actually of um, trying to observe our own practice and then noticing what we're sensing while doing that sensing in our bodies, sensing how our senses are, of the world are shifting as we start to observe what we're doing. Um, so that, that's what came up for me. Yeah, yeah I can uh, jump yeah. in on this because I think it's a really important point because for, for Mao, but I think, you know, outside of Mao, just for us in our conversation here, if you approach sense perception, understanding and practice as if they are these discrete entities that are separate and disconnected from one another, you're approaching them non-dialectically. Right? And one of the powers of dialectics is to recognize that relations are primary, not fixed entities. Meaning, more simplistically, right, you are understanding and perceiving and acting in the world all at the same time in the and all of these elements of, of your experience are intertwined with one another. And so what Mao, I think, is encouraging us to understand is that, yes, there's this dialectical uh, kind of um, entwinement of these different elements. But at the same time, we can, from a certain vantage point, recognize that there is a difference between being able to see something and understand where it comes from. And there's an enormous difference between being able to understand something and knowing how to change it or being able to change it. Right? And so at that level, dialectical thinking allows us to see that, yes, all of these processes are going on at the same time. But even though they're going on at the same time and they're relationally constituted, we can nonetheless distinguish, you know, heuristically between kind of different levels. And I do think that that's important. The other, I guess, point in the question, if I understood it correctly, is how that relates to being outside of a kind of academic framework or academic uh, discourse. I think that that's absolutely essential in the sense that, you know, Mao was talking about this as he was making the revolution in China. He wasn't talking about it in uh, university lectures and that it's precisely outside of the academy where you can always be anchored in concrete practice and have the, the kind of primacy of knowledge with use value, right? knowing something because it's useful, because it explains something and allows you to navigate and hopefully transform the world. And within the academy, unfortunately, there's so much knowledge that's based on exchange value, where you get invested in something, you learn a set of proper names or fancy ways of speaking, and then you can cash in on that by going to a conference and impressing someone. And we all know how those particular games work. They usually don't have any use value whatsoever to the working and toiling masses. And so I think it's, uh, on the contrary, it's outside of the academy that usually the primacy of practice and the importance of use value is very, very palpable. Because if you say shit, it's incoherent, but sounds really fancy, nobody's going to care and it doesn't have any traction in the real world. Yeah. And I mean, to me, this is actually um, re relates back to childhood, right? Which is like children are like, you know, whenever I'm around like, the babies and, and young children, like, I just feel like, like, they like, that's what I'm trying to do, because they're like, wait, why do we do this? And you tell them, and they're like, because of this. And they're like, wait, why do we do it that? And it's like, because this, and you know, eventually, it's just like, that's just how we do it, right? Which is basically just like, I don't have any more time. And basically, us just admitting, like, there's no re like, we don't really know, like, we just do it like that. And we could totally do it differently, right? So but the kid is asking is like, wait, why do we do it like that? Why can't we do it this other way? And so we all have that kind of, you know, like, I mean, it's not like natural or anything like that, but like that kind of like, you know, like, wait, why, right? That's, and that's, for me, that's what philosophy really is. It's like, wait, why? You know, philosophy doesn't really have answers. You know, it has like, why? And then, well, maybe this and that. And then you test it out in practice. And I feel like, honestly, critical thinking is in a sense, like not the problem because, you know, I mean, I don't really know what it means to think critically. Um, I know what it means to think, but there's so much critique and, 
you know, I experienced this in schools and that's why most of my education, like for real, like came from the movement. You know, I learned way more my first year in like an organization than I did my entire, you know, PhD program for real. Um, because it was in, and I learned because it was like driven by revolutionary optimism. Look, people have changed the world. You know, every social system presents itself as natural and timeless and the culmination of everything that happened before, right? Marx points this out in the introduction to the Grunjusa actually. Right. Um, that's a historical presentation. And so then just realizing that, like, wait, like it wasn't always like this, you know. And in fact, if we were sitting around in like 1840 in the United States, there would be a lot of people like well-meaning of different you know, nationalities who would be like, well, slavery is terrible, but like it's just the way it's always been. And like, what are we going to do without it? And like it's going to be anarchy and whatnot. It helps like, you know, recall that present that past that is still very present. Right. Um, and there's like inaugurate the sense of like, oh yeah, possibility. Like actually we can have revolutions. We literally like masses, the masses of people, you know, not the intellectuals. Mm -hmm. Intellectuals have never like changed the world, right? And like, that was the key for Lenin, right? Is it like the people make the revolution, right? And the party, in the party, all distinctions between intellectuals and workers and other things, they're all, they're gone, right? We're all, party members, right? Um, and I think that the other thing is like, rather than critical thinking i'm just interested in thinking you know like critical thinking is always about critique 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 and there's always you know what how can i problematize this or like you know complicate that or whatever um and you know i'm always asking like well just think you know like i don't what do you think about it right um and so i don't know if it's like moving through stages per se um but rather just like kind of thinking about what's or thinking and experiencing what you're already doing in the world in, within this framework and maybe it helps you and maybe it doesn't right um so that's what i wanted to say with that about that um it has to be collective we already do it you know basically and then capital what it does is just you know confines us it like closes down what we look at so like I'm, i drive to work and like there's so all of a sudden I was looking, I'll be like, wait, what the hell is that? You know, and there's like the whole history, as Gabriel said, about its production. And there's a whole history of the different functions it served, you know, why it's there and how it's changed and what it could be that we just don't really think about because it's naturalized and because like, you know, I got to get to work. Right? It's like that's the main thing. Uh, and that's the way the capital, again, closes down what we can sense and what we can sense. And it also explains why, like in Indianapolis, unless like, since 2018, we've had to defeat like three different anti-homeless bills, right? They were all about moving homeless people out of the city center, mm -hmm. right? To literally like change the field of visibility so that they're like on the outskirts of it. Yep, I can attest to that also in New York City. That has definitely been, that's definitely been a, a key issue and, and yeah. very visible uh, yeah. to, to, to anyone who's, the rem remotely observant. Um, and can I, wait, can I say one more thing? Actually, yeah, for sure. This reminds ahead. me, because when I first got involved in the struggle, it was like one of the first things I did. There was I was fortunate to be with this guy named Sam Alcoff, who kind of took me under his wing. And this was uh, in Julia after Giuliani's reign of terror in New York City, and he was running for I think state gov the governor of New York State. So we organized a protest. And at that time, you know, the cops had shot Amadou Diallo, you know, Abner Louima had happened. And it wasn't really a mass consciousness, you know, like the, it wasn't in people's field of visibility or audibility. And then I remember in 2010 being in the streets, struggling against police brutality. And the main demand was like body cameras, you know? And I remember thinking like, well, obviously that's not the ultimate solution, but you know, like you can't tell people that, but let's take them through the experience, right? And this is why, you know, the, the, I, the Indianapolis police murdered uh, a 39 year old man, Herman Whitfield III. You can go to indieliberationcenter.org to learn about this. We just got the full body cam footage that obviously shows that the cops were lying the whole time. But one of the things that the body cam footage has done is changed and, uh, and opened up people's like ability to see, right? And ability to like actually un understand, right? That this is not like, these are not one-offs. These are not like bad apples, that this is systematic. And that this is basically like a military occupation of oppressed communities in the United States. And so I think that that is like also something that we we experience as we go through the movement itself. Thank you. Yeah, no, completely. I mean, it's the, it's the unnamed masses that are leading revolution. Um, I uh, have two last questions um, in the chat um, that I'm going to voice. Um, 
One asks, um, I'm wondering if Derek has looked into Herbert, um, excuse me if the pronunciation is wrong, Marcus's uh, perception of aesthetic and language in relation to divorcing from the dominant ideology and discourse and what his take is on that. And then we also have uh, Khadija who asks, how do we cut through the, I quote, ideas industry of academia, yet still make use of the various philosophers in the Marxist tradition? So we're just gonna let, let that sit. Um, and if anyone wants to jump in, feel free to. Somebody else should talk. Mm -hmm. All right. Oh. Have I been off mute this whole time? Great, I'm just like humming in the back, sorry. <laughs> um, okay, I think I can say something to the second question. I like it a lot. I mean, I, ha I actually don't really have very many answers, but I relate to the question a lot because um, I think about it a lot about how to make these ideas that uh, often come from academia that are very philosophical. Maybe you need a lot of, yeah, like ideas industry, exactly. Thank you, Khadija. Um, that that you need like background, I think, basically, to like understand it. And I think something I could say to that is that one, it's not about you're not smart enough to understand it if you don't have an education and da 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 da. Obviously oh. not, right? Like also as like organizers, like you have to commit to the understanding that working class people are intelligent and can understand things if we just sit with it and. Uh, and so, but but the but it is difficult in the sense that you haven't read everything that they're referencing. And a lot of times these philosophers will use words and throw things out there and they don't never define it. And then if you <laughs> read like 30 words on a page that you know makes no sense to you with no definitions for it, you're gonna get exhausted and give up, right? So I think that, um, I mean, the only way to overcome it, I would say is like, I mean, in my imagination is collective, collectively going through it and going through it really slowly, I would imagine, you know, like pause at every, every word that we don't understand and try to like someone look it up or like does anyone have any idea or like we don't understand you know what I mean like really go through it slowly and I feel like it takes a lot of time and it's very different probably from how people study those texts in academia but I think honestly they would I think a lot of people in academia just pretend to understand things when they don't but um that's what I think I think that like ex like defining everything going slowly is a good way to do it because a lot of times like you know as like a lot of the people here have demonstrated in their own work, like those those ideas can be very useful to us to get us to think, but uh, it's just a question of, you know, us being able to collectively get together and be able to like peer through the jargon, which honestly is useless. And I think I want to speak to the second question as well. You know, I'm not in academia one day, you know, get there one day, but haven't made it there yet. Um, but I think just seeing how this there's an idea industry outside of academia. There's an idea industry in community organizing, actually, where they want to sit and they want to talk about Marx and Lenin, but they don't want to put it into practice. And they want to have all these great ideas and they want to be the holder. They want to be the pedagogue so bad that they forget about the practice. And they also forget that people have been learning since before people were teaching. And so I think how we cut through this, I, I really agree with Summer is, you know, Working class people, you know, I do believe I've heard several times in different, you know, academic spaces that I'm in that, you know, people just need to take their time with it. They just need to sit with it. I also believe that we got to be realistic about the working class goes through on a day to day. And what, you know, what is what actually is in there? What can they do at that moment? How do we meet them where they're at with these texts? And that also means translating it. I speak a different language than everybody on this panel. I speak Southern African American vernacular. So maybe someone should translate it so that it wouldn't take so long for me to grasp it. You know, maybe we should, as organizers and as people as academia, we need to get more creative with how we ask people to engage with these texts. Because at the end of the day, when you're community organizing, asking somebody to join a study group, that's an ask. You're asking them for time. You're asking them for trust. You're asking them for the, the faith that they that you'll be able to speak to them. You're asking them for a lot of things. So let's give something back because that's how we're going. That's the only way we're going to cut through this idea industry is actually give these material things back in a way that they can interpret and understand. 
And also quickly want to speak to the one of the questions that I wanted to speak to, but I didn't get a chance about is Marxist, you know, is these Marxist texts, are they useless? I, as somebody, again, who did not grow up in an academic world, who did not know when I first joined the Party for Socialism and Liberation, didn't even know anything about Marx or Lenin. I was like, all right, cool. Like, what can they tell me about my life and my struggle? That was my first thought when I joined the party. And as I began, as I went to these different, you know, cadre schools and these different like real educational processes, I learned about these different theories that have helped me think dialectically and have helped shape the way that I think and understand my material world and conditions. And no matter how many years go by, no matter how many hundreds and hundreds of years, that's vital. That's vital is to change, it's change our thinking and change us into dialectical thinkers and shape the way people think and shape the way we interpret and things like that. And I think, you know, the person said that, you know, they, they're not used to studying, they're not used to, acad you know, this academic. You just, you know, just figure out a way to make it work for you. There's so many resources, YouTube videos, podcasts, there's so many different ways this, you know, Marxism and Leninism has been transmitted for us to understand it. And it's, it's still being done. You know, Derek did the Capital with Comrades. It's still being twisted and shaped and developed. It just takes, you know, a group, I would always say an organization to help you find that way that works for you, to help you find a way that you need to learn and also create a new way to learn. Oh, I didn't understand it this way, but I understood it when I did this. Let me share the wealth of what I just created so that more people who might have this challenge will get it. Yeah. Thank, yeah, thank you. I think, um, I mean, just in response to, uh, you know, the question about Marcuse, I mean, one thing is that, yeah, it's from the Frankfurt School and in Gabriel's piece that came out in Domination and Emancipation, uh, he makes an exception for Marcuse as one of the few of the Frankfurt School who advised, you know, uh, was a PhD advisor for Angela Davis and how he's been actually written out of that history. You can correct me if I'm wrong, Gabriel, but anyways, in terms of his thing about, you know, it's, it's thinking about uh, aesthetics and politics, I think, you know, I mean, I'm not an expert, but the the one of the reasons why I don't go there and said I start with Rock Hill and De La Ponce's work is because they don't uh, they are they argue there's no such thing as art, right? Like art is not this thing, right? Neither is politics. Art becomes art, right, as a result of uh, struggles over its production, its distribution, and its consumption, right? And it becomes political in the you know, when it's in integrated into battles, right? And those battles to make something are, are political, right? And the only reason we can even think about aesthetics or art as separate categories is because we live in a society with an advanced division of labor, right? It's a point Althusser makes. Like, you can't have literary criticism that says this is, you know, artistic work and this is not artistic work without like a very advanced division of labor and people actually do that. And then map these categories on to other things and make us think, which is why I was always, I was always discouraged. I, I, I didn't think I could understand aesthetics or art, right? And I still, I mean, you know, and that's what I like about it is because I don't understand it, right? We don't have to understand or know everything or like be comfortable with everything, you know? The the texts that I like the most are the like the ones that I read again and again because I I never know, you know? There's, there's texts that I teach like, I've taught like 18 times. And every time I read it, I'm like, wait, I never, I didn't notice that before. Or like, honestly, I still don't know what that means, you know? And that's an important, I think, part of teaching too, just being like, I, you know, I don't know, I'm just doing the best I can also, right? Um, and the and the other thing, of course, is, you know, the, the autonomy of art thesis. And this is something that uh, I bring up in the, intro, in the introduction in chapter one, which is like, you know, the, the idea that art is like autonomous from society or should be, um, uh, in Rock Hill's book, Radical History and the Politics of Art, I think he talks about how the auto like the autonomy of art thesis was actually like one it's like a social product right and also it was it served political purposes because it was used by anti-communist forces to basically say like look at all of the all of the art in social societies it's all about you know politics and so therefore we have real freedom in the united states because art can be about anything you want it to be right so this idea that art is autonomous is actually an extremely political idea and is actually like basically a weapon right in terms of breaking out of the theory industry i mean one you know marx wasn't writing for academics right i mean like he wasn't he was and you know this is this is i end the introduction with this i talked about this elsewhere but like you know marx and Engels, they were always like like we like we're, the the masses have to liberate themselves and we can't tolerate anybody or any group who talks down to them as if they can't understand them 
right? Because usually that's just what happens and that's alienating and it's like off-putting and it's just, you know, it's also not true, right? Because nobody's really like smarter than anybody else per se. Um, and the other thing is like moving intellectual, the, the idea that intellectual and like production and ideas happen in the university is like a strange one to me being in the university. Cause like the, there's much more thinking and intellectual production that goes on in the streets and in the struggles and in the community organizations. And there's actually like very little and, you know, not to discount the work that, you know, people do in academia, but like, for me, that's not the place intellectual production happens, particularly like revolutionary intellectual production happens, right? Like no idea has been created in the university and it's been like disseminated and caused a revolution, right? That's not how it works. Um, so that's where intellectual production takes place in the very, you know, at the beginning. Um, and then the idea of the idea industry and the movement, we need to pay more attention to this, you know? Like the response to the, you know, uh, really insurgent movement of black people and young people and uh, Chicano people at the time and LGBT people uh, in the 60s and 70s, you know, that counteroffensive was like obviously based on political repression, assassinations, imprisonments, et cetera, but also like through all these nonprofit NGOs and the production and the proliferation of all these ideas to kind of blunt the revolutionary edge. And we have we see that infiltrate struggles all the time. And that's why I'm talking about the overcoming this break in ideological continuity, right? Which is not to say that, you know, again, for me, Marxism, it's like, I don't care what it's called ultimately, right? Like you can call it whatever you want. I usually talk about communism, you know, but it can be something else, you know? It's not about like who, you know, what name we attach to it or like where it comes from or when it comes from. It's about its ability to help us understand and transform the world ultimately. Um, and so, I think, oh yeah, the other thing is I would recommend that people pick up Nino Brown's edited book, Revolutionary Education, because I think that has a lot of, uh, at the end, it has some like, you know, teaching strategies, discussion strategies, but also talks a lot more about this in terms of, you know, like translating all of this into, into actual political spaces. Oh, and the other thing is, look how much, in terms of translation, look at how significant, you know, the socialist states especially the USSR at the beginning, what were in actually alphabetizing languages, you know, the Bolsheviks called Russia the prison house of nations because there were like, you know, I think over a hundred nationalities living within it. They were all forced to speak Russian, you know, they couldn't speak their own language. And one of the first things the Soviets did was they started to finally alphabetize and to give people the right to speak their own language. And even at one point, like if there were two students and two or four students in a school that were of a minority nationality, they 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 could petition to be taught have their kids taught in their in their like in, in their in their language you know read in their language sing in their language and all of that um so like you know we have to have power in order to do that though right thank you so much for these for these really fruitful um last last lingering thoughts um i know i'm leaving this talk feeling more energized and and full of revolutionary optimism than before I came in here. So I think I think everyone um, who's joined us in this panel and all the panelists who have joined today, I'm like, please pat yourself on the back. I feel like everyone has just this this community of of theorists and thinkers and and writers and and just revolutionary people is is ultimately just the just being in your presence is is a gift. So thank you so much for everyone. And, and thank you to Derek for uh, giving us a reason to be in the same room together today. Um, I know we're all so proud of this piece of scholarship and uh, we urge our, you know, our audience to, to read this book and add their own critiques and thoughts. Um, so if anyone else has any other last minute um, thoughts, I think we're good to wrap up. Um, thank you so much for uh, everyone who's tuned in um, and all of our co-sponsors at the People's Forum, Midnight Books, Mayday Books, Iskra Books, um, everyone, all the panelists, Kim Smith, Derek Ford, Jennifer De La Pont, uh, uh, De La Pons, who couldn't be here to get today, um, Summer Papachin, Gabriel Rockhill, Dear everyone, thank you so much for being a part of this uh, discussion. And I hope that we can revisit for that workshop, <laughs> that workshop book that we were talking about um, at the end, perhaps another project in the works. So thank you so much for tuning in and, and I hope you all have a lovely weekend. Thank you. Thanks so much, everybody.